the new Hallam FM now on Sheffield 852-050. Right, on we go. We've got a few more of those to do before midnight, but we've got a few more of these to talk to as well. Uh, in Doncaster, Gary, hello. Hello, James. Garfield. A couple of things I'd like to take up with you, but right. just before I do, yeah. uh, the first call that you had on tonight, you made a statement about Frank Cannon in the film. Yeah, well, in, said, the, in the series. In the series, yeah. yeah. And you said, well, it, there was a film that led into the series, wasn't there? Well, was there a film of, uh, of canon, was there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, oh, I, oh, I wish I'd known. Perhaps it... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, you I'm said... I'm upset now. You said that there was a young, fit guy who yeah. came at him and, with a knife and he disarmed him and then you laughed. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Because Frank Cannon... Yeah. Couldn't disarm. Hey! The only band that he could disarm would be a fruit machine. Hang about. Right? I used to study martial arts. And there was a guy there who was built exactly like Frank Cannon. Yes. And believe me, he would have, dis he would have disarmed somebody with a knife without any effort. <laughs> well, perhaps he could. Well, the, the part that Frank Cannon was playing yeah. was a detective who'd studied judo, so he's it's got to act the part that he's supposed to be. Hey, I didn't know that Frank had studied judo. Well, I, you I, don't I wasn't see you make these preposterous statements. I don't think it was made clear in the opening titles, right? Yeah. Frank Cannon, black belt. It was. I, I'd, admittedly, you know, about a 62 belt. If you followed this, if you followed that series, yeah, from the beginning, it was made very clear that he was a black belt at judo. Well, I'm, I'm afraid, with all respect to the great detective, I was not. <laughs> my, my disbelief was not suspended because he used to get out of his Buick and walk to the, uh, you know, to the porch of the house where someone had been kidnapped or getting threatening phone calls. Yeah. And he was out of breath by the time he got to the front door. <laughs> Gasping and wheezing. Don't tell me he could disarm this young teddy boy or whatever he was. Well, he did it, didn't he? A, a, a shark or a jet or whatever this lad was. Well, he did, yes, but it wasn't real. He was an axer, the lad. Anyway. It wasn't really a hoodlum. Yeah, uh, on to a more serious point. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, <laughs> if, if indeed there is such a thing. Uh, well, the, you'll, you'll, you've no chance in this area, you know that, don't you? Uh, oh, <laughs> seems to be doing rather nicely so far. Carry well, on. We've all got such good sense of humour, you know. Oh, I see, really. Yeah, that's, well, this is it. Go on. I'll t I'll t go <laughs> Almost on. all, anyway. I mean, that woman that you had on before, I mean, she ain't got a clue what a joke is. No, no, no. I mean, you no. cracked a joke, she, she didn't even think it was funny. Yeah, mind you, that has happened before. Well, I mean, yeah. you know what to do, don't you? Send them a couple of free tickets to Bernard Manning. Oh, oh, the undisputed champion, eh? <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. Anyway, go on. Uh, voting. Uh, you voting. said a few nights ago, I've been trying to get on ever since, but you're so... Got so many calls popular man, yeah. in yeah. that I've had to wait till now to get on. Okay then. Um you said that voting should be compulsory. Yeah. Why? Why? Hmm. Because it would reflect the it would therefore reflect more accurate accurately the uh, the wishes of the people. If the voting system was a correct one and they counted in every individual vote, yeah. Yeah. But take for example the system we've got now, um in Doncaster, yeah. it's obviously gonna be a Labour victory. Yeah. Now, if it if it was close, which it wouldn't be, but if it was, then all them Conservative votes would be wiped out, wouldn't it? Oh yes, I mean you're, you're talking about tackling the, uh, the the bigger problem of the the actual electoral but system that we have. Don't you think that uh, if you made it compulsory, a lot of people that don't know anything about politics wouldn't know who to vote for anyway, so they just wouldn't tick the box. <laughs> just a minute, that happens anyway. Yeah, I know it does. The majority of people don't know don't know what day it is, it's but still they're still true in time. Uh, We've got a choice. We either make I think it should work like this. We either make it compulsory yeah. or scrub it all together. If you made it compulsory, how would you yeah. make it compulsory? If they still didn't vote, what would you do? Lock yeah. them up? You, you, you fine people, that's what they do in Australia. Yeah, but they didn't pay the fine. What are you going to do? Lock them up just because they didn't vote? Lock them up, yeah, and never, ever, ever let them out. <laughs> unless they were really, really sorry. <laughs> well, this voting uh, business... Yeah. Next I one. think that the only way to make it, uh, to, to do the vote, is to educate people from the beginning, in schools, in politics, like they do English, history, maths, or any science. And, and the only people that are allowed to vote, yeah. that are qualified to vote, are the people that get at least an O-level in politics. Mm. Because it's only then that they would have any idea who to vote for anyway. It's not a bad idea, that. That's not a bad idea, because they only let people with uh, qualifications in chemistry become chemists, don't they? You're, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like if you went to, for a job as a chef, you know. 
And, uh, and they said, uh, can you cook? Do you know anything about being a chef? He said, well, no, but I, I read the, uh, the cookery page in the Daily Mail now and again. You know, so will that do? They wouldn't say, yeah, smashing, would they? No, no. But that's what they do when it comes to voting. Mm. Do you want to vote for, uh, to choose the government of this country? Oh, yes, please. Do you know anything about it? Uh, do you know anything about economics? Do you know anything about social policy? Do you know anything about, uh, oh, well, I read the sun. <laughs> oh, smashing. Jasper's carrot tells a very good story. I'm not sure whether we can do it, actually. Yeah. He tells a very good, uh, story about, uh, the sun. A very good gag. Should I steal it? Yeah, go on. Right, I'll share it with you. I'll share it with you, Gary. Uh, he says, why have people who read the sun got black doings it, private parts? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is because the ink comes off on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a newspaper joke, Gary, and I'd like you to, uh, stand by me at the tribunal, if you will. <laughs> Great. Um, the other thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you had somebody on last night who said we should get rid of money. Yeah. Uh, which is a balmy idea because you can't possibly. No, it wouldn't, no. Well, it'd slow everything down a bit. Maybe we will one day. Maybe when all the oil runs out. And you'd have to change the system, but you, you, you could get rid of money and use something in place of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's what money is. Money is in place of something. That's right, yeah. Money is in place of bags of wheat and... and what what I paper. would like to know about, mm. about this business is, yeah. uh, the money comes from the Royal Mint. Yeah. Which the government are in charge of. Yeah. Now, if our country owes so much to another country, yeah. why don't they just print another batch? Oh, well, now, now, come along, come along, because that leads to hyperinflation. That's the whole point. Well, why? They don't print money. Because, as the value of... Well, they print it in the first place. They print it in the first place, but they print a fit. Do you know the Roman Empire suffered from inflation? They had terrible trouble with inflation. That, that's recorded. Mm. One of their concerns. They were just as concerned about inflation as we were in the 70s and, and 80s. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the 60s, it was the balance of payments we were supposed to be concerned about. And before that, it was something else we were supposed to be concerned about. Mm. Uh, Hitler, I think. And then something else before that, unemployment. Uh, so we never, as soon as we sort one out, they, uh, another one pops up. Or maybe... They just tell us it has. Ha ha. Yeah, but right. what would not. happen? What would happen if the country printed an extra batch of money and paid off a debt? Right. Well, what what happens is that the more money you have, it's it's like having something in. It's like having a glass of Ribena, and yeah. if, you, if you've not got enough Ribena to uh, to give everyone body a drink, yeah. Then you just keep adding more water, don't you? Yeah, and it gets watered and down. And it gets watered down. That's what happens. You see, if you print more money, then the the relative value of things remains unchanged. So it's, I mean, you saw it happening in the, in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And a tin of beans cost fourpence, uh, or some, uh, something costs a hundred pounds, you see. And the price goes up to a hundred and ten pounds. So you give, yeah. you give the man who's buying it a hundred and ten pounds in his wages, and he, he takes his money, his extra ten pounds, but you have to pay him, so you have to put your prices up ten pounds to pay him, so he can buy the... Never, no, yeah, yeah, it's and, a never-ending right. link. And now eventually someone has to give them the money, and this means that prices of everything are going up. You, if you, for example, uh, manufacture asphalt, which is used for road building, mm. and the government or local authority is your biggest customer, you have to charge them more, so they have to get more money from somewhere. If it's the... If yeah. it's a local authority, yeah. they get it off the rate payers. I, 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 if it's I, I, the government, they have to print more, they either have to take it off the taxpayer or print more money to pay for it. Yeah, I can see your point now, you've explained yeah. it like that. Well, but you, but, yeah, but, I mean, but the problem is, the problem is, when we're watching uh, these politics arguments on show, on television, yeah. in the afternoon, they don't explain such basic questions as that one I've just put to you in the way that you've just explained it. Well, they, 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 we're listening in on their discussion. Half of us have got no idea what they're really talking about. That's right. We, we might be sitting here thinking, well, I, I don't agree with these water meters, or I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that, but we, we, we don't understand why they're doing it. Well, that is one of my gifts, Gary. One of men. Is it Gary or Garfield? Oh, it's Gary, Is yeah. it Garfield? No, it's, it's Gary. I like guys in Sir Garfield Sobers. <laughs> Great cricketer. Yeah, it's just one of your gifts, of course. Yes, is the ability to... I mean, you go in a shop and you, you're thinking, right, um, I want to buy, I want to buy a record player. Right? Yeah. Or I think they, uh, they call them, don't they call them CDs now, I believe? Yeah. Anyway, you think, well, I want to buy a... Well, they don't call them CDs. I mean, a CD's not a record player. Is it not? Anyway, whatever, you know, the black thing on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, God. Right. The, one, the thing you see, a, a scouser walking around with under his arm. Right. Yeah. So you think, well, I, bet, I, I want to get a good one, so I'll, I'll go and get one of these books on hi-fis, right? Yeah. And you pick it up, and it doesn't, you're expecting it'll say, uh, a, a Frobisher and, uh, and Gartside... 
um, CD player is very good, get one of them. It doesn't say that, does it? No. It no. says, the, uh, we, we found that the Wolford Tweeter was uh, a little bit over-modded on the, and all it, and you think, oh, I don't, oh, all I want to know is, is it worth it? Is it worth 250 quid or what? Yeah. That's yeah. all I need to know. Yeah. So there's this assumed level of knowledge, you see. Yeah. And there's also an element of what we call in politics. Mm. The, have you ever heard the expression, the mushroom treatment? No, I can't say that. No. They treat people the way they treat mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, you know what happens to mushrooms, don't you? Go on. They, they keep them in the dark, <laughs> and they give them a load of... Anyway, that's yeah. all we've got time for on this particular... Thank you, thank you, all right? So now you'll know the next time somebody asks you. Uh, and I think we more or less covered that point. Yes, but it is nice to be ex able to explain things in terms... Instead of trying to blind you with science on this programme, we tell it like it is. We, we put it in terms that the man in the street can understand, that the man by the Mexborough Mickey Mouse fountain can grasp... And that is one of our great strengths, and one which you, we shall continue to play to. Through, to. Play to. Yes, that's right. Play to. Play to. Yes. Um, another, another silly song sound. Jonathan from Sheffield says that um, Queen have got a record called Breakthrough. I didn't know that. Is that right? Okay, yeah, well, maybe they have. Maybe it's one of their lesser-known hits. And uh, he says that uh, it sounds for all the world as if it's called Grapefruit. No, I'm sorry, Midget Gem still gets my vote. Right. Um, what was there? Was there another one? There's another one. I'm trying to think of it. Anyway, I'll think of it sooner or later, and I bet you can't wait, and you're on the edge of your seat. Uh, nine minutes to uh, midnight. I'm not standing for all that business about Frank Cannon. I still think he'd have been clapped out. But uh, anyway, it's all right. You can't argue anymore. We're off to Sheffield uh, somewhere next. These first, though. Tick Hill Garden Centres are celebrating 25 years of serving you. Tick Hill Garden Centres really are the gardener's choice. It's our <laughs> loss. Right. Uh, every time to throw in another lesson. No, we won't. We'll go elsewhere. Because we have got somewhere out there, and believe me, I'm not looking forward to this either, it's time to say once again hello to... Margaret! Yeah, I've been trying to shout you and you've been checking the notes here, that busy gossiping. That's correct. I've been wanting to go to the smallest room in the house here, and you wouldn't want to call it. You wouldn't listen when I'm shouting you to tell you where I was going in case you thought I'd rung off. Oh, I see. Well, uh, well uh, go now. Eh? Uh, can I? Yeah. Okay, then. But, um, put the, you know, cover the phone up. Get lost. Oh. I'm right out the other side. I have to, I have to run. All right, then. Well, never mind. I promise not to, to make you laugh. Yeah, no, but you don't need to make me laugh. Oh, no. Is it... it I didn't know she got an outside one. This is ridiculous. Anyway, while, um... While Margaret's, um, elsewhere... Oh, in actual fact, we've got um, a letter from uh, Gary in uh, Doncaster, who's an organist. And what's more, he's a, an FLSM, an ILSM, a TD, a CT, and a VCM, <clears throat> to his name. And uh, he, says, he says the following, does Gary, James, why on earth do you put up with that boring, stupid idiot Henry from Retford? How dare you? Personally, I would rather listen to a kettle boil. Next time Dave rings up, please ask him if he is an actor, because I think he played Norman Bates in the film Psycho. Well, yet yeah, actually, if you look very closely at Eric Cantona... Are you still there? No, I'm, just, I'm just explaining something, Margaret. Can you oh, just bear yeah. with me a second? Thank you. Not football again. It's just, just briefly touching on football, oh, but I promise not to dwell. Oh, you with that football. Well, you know, you know the old gag, Margaret, don't you? Oh, no, and I don't want to uh, know. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Oh, heck. It, this, is the, this is the gag. What's the difference between match of the day and the toilet bowl? <laughs> One goes round and the other goes up. No, 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 no. <laughs> Preposterously. <laughs> Preposterously wrong. The answer is, what's the difference between match of the day and the toilet bowl? Men never miss much of the day. Yeah, you're dead right there, but they yeah. always miss the toilet, huh? Well, that's right. Yes, that's the point of the gag. Ah, no. You have to fill in the gaps yourself. To explain to them, you silly. Now, just let me finish this letter, Margaret. Oh, right. no, not again. Have you washed your hands? No, I no. haven't. Well, I go... don't need to. It's only me own thingy, uh, isn't it? Oh, dear. I'm not touching anybody no, else. No, all right, all right, all right. We don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was just going to say that if you if you look if you look at Eric Cantona, I don't want to. I'm not, right now, you just now you shut up now. I'll come back to you in a moment. If you look at Eric Cantona, especially when he's concentrating on something like kicking somebody, for example, he 
But when his eyebrows meet in the middle, he does look very much like Norman Bates. In fact, so much so that, as you've probably noticed if you've followed the game of football, over the last couple of weeks he started behaving like him. Now then, the letter continues from Gary. Carry on insulting all the riffraff. And by the way, a name for the programme, Carry On James. I don't know. Or you could call it Water Plants Indoors. Yes, that's quite good. Yours sincerely, Gary. Now then, listen to this bit. P.S. If half of what you spiel out is true, then you are a quarter as clever as I am. Well, I'm afraid you hoist with your own petard there, pal, because if you're so clever, you would know whether half of what I say is true or not, wouldn't you? Ha ha! Ha 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 ha! So stick that in your mere shaum. And, uh, and that. Anyway, back to Margaret now. Hello, Margaret. Yeah, but you're not all as clever as me, kid. You're only half clever, you see. Oh, I see. I'm all clever. You're half clever. Right. Well, right. Uh, yes. But, um, whereas, so you would say, whereas, uh, I'm a wit. Uh, well, I've got you're to, I've got to, I've got to, um, by the sound of things, you definitely will. Angela, now, who has just got, uh, five minutes with which to give us her all. Hello, Angela. Hello. Hello. I want to speak about organ donors. Right. Oh, I see. Like, um, hang on, what's his name? Gary Burt. I don't know. No, never mind. <laughs> Different type of organ. Oh, I we see. Could, we could do a very, a very good, uh, Liberace gag, but we won't, we wouldn't get away with it. So let's, uh, let's go on. We just managed to fit you on the very end, Angela. Right. No, I'd just like to say that I think people should carry the card. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> that is it. Well, keep going. No, that's it, because, like, there's loads and loads of people out there that are prepared to, you know, give all their organs, but they just don't carry a card to let people know that. Yeah, it's, uh, still four, uh, not four minutes to two. Oh, I, I can't speak any more. I don't know what else to say. Well, it's a bit embarrassing now because, um, uh, you know, I thought you were going to tell us something about organ donation and... No, I don't. I just want to. That's it. It's, uh... I thought you were going to tell me something about it, actually, because I don't know much about it. Um, oh, it's straightforward. They uh, whip them out and whip them into somebody <laughs> else. Right. And that's, uh, that's about it, really. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm, so you don't agree with it yourself? Pardon me? Yeah. What? You, do, you, do you agree with it yourself? With it organ donation? Yeah. Oh, very much so, yes. Oh. Why? I can think of, uh, I've got a few organs. I wouldn't mind, um, you know, seeing inside some other people. Oh, I see. <clears throat> right. Well, that were it. So, uh, they can't all be gems. Right. <clears throat> Three minutes to. So, uh, right. Can I say hello to someone? Hey? Can I say hello to someone? I suppose so, yeah. You just go, ooh, like that, and they'll look round. And, uh, finally, I think we'll have to, um... Oh, dear, you know, I thought we were going to get so much out of Angela. Anyway, let's have a word with Muriel. Hello. By golly, my goodness me. My goodness I gracious. I can say all I want to say in a short time, if you'll leave me alone, right? I'd never touch you, missus. Uh, I know, mister. <laughs> as little apparent haste as possible, and to Doncaster. And, uh, it's Gary here, I think. Hello. Hello, James. Gary Garfield. Um, I've got some excellent news for you in a moment. What news have you for well, me? I, I, I'm just going to say that just for one moment, because I, I want to make a quick comment first yeah. about that letter that you read out of mine last night. Oh, it's, yes, 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 yes. Uh, the latter part of the letter, well, in fact, the PS, in fact, it finished by saying, if half of what you spill out is true, then yeah. you are as quarter as clever as me. Yeah. And your reply was, if I were so clever, then I would know whether it was true or not. Yeah. What you were spitting at. You know. I've got to hand it to you, James. That's an excellent reply, is that? Yes, it's, of course it's, it's it is. It's a great reply, that. A seven out of ten. Yeah. But uh, you've got another one up your sleeve. Seven out of ten for that. Uh, but what did you mean? How dare I about Henry? Henry? Yeah. Henry is a sort. Look, night after night we sit here lamenting the falling standards in our society. Yeah. Right. The brutalisation of it. The the the, the, the cult of yobboism, which seems to be taking it over when Kelvin McKenzie is... Yes, uh, well, and all it right. And, and Henry adds a, a touch of culture. He raises the tone, I feel. Yes, uh, but you, you don't like all this uh, business about, hello, hello, James, hello, hello, James, uh, am, am I on? Uh, am, I, am I on? You know, you, don't, you can't stand that, can you? 
Well, to uh, be frank. He could probably tidy that up a little, I'll, yeah. I'll admit. I mean, yeah. it comes on and it... Hello, James. Henry here. You know, and I think you think, oh, dear, dear, dear. yeah. Recognise it a mile away. It's to you, indeed. Well, you're certainly a keen student of it, I must admit. This, I've got some excellent news for you. No, I got you. Have Last I got... night we were talking about Frank Cannon. And you was very, very disheartened indeed when I told you that it, there was a feature length film and you'd obviously not seen it. Oh, you're not going to send it, me. Yeah. Well, I've got it on video. Oh. Now, I thought you you'd want a copy. <laughs> you tragic figure. <laughs> what are you doing with... Oh, oh dear. What am I... What do you mean, what am I doing? So, you actually think that during the precious... The, the few hours of daylight I get to myself... And bear in mind that spring is just around the corner, even though it is lashing down at the moment. <laughs> yeah. That I'm going to sit indoors watching the feature length <laughs> film of Cannon. <laughs> well, that's your choice. Do you want a joke? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll tell. Hey, no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story. Just you can finish with a gag, right? Leave, right. Them, leave them laughing. Okay. But I'll tell you a true story. We're um, I'm talking to a couple of pals of mine. And the subject of, uh, of of old TV programmes cropped up, you see. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we were talking about William Tell. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you remember it? Uh, can't say as I do, no. Now, William... Come away, come away with William Tell. Come away to the land he yeah. loved so I, well. I know the song, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, know, I know the yes, scene, but I can't, right. can't remember the film. Uh, well, it was a television series in the 60s. William Tell, it was in black and white and all the rest of it. Well, well, and, well uh, until 65. Well, then, I can't help that, right. <laughs> uh, Donald Pleasance was in it from time to time, playing the evil Austrian, and a, a big fat bloke called, an enormously fat bloke called uh, Willoughby Goddard, which yes. is a frightfully actor's name, isn't it? Willoughby Goddard, he was Landberger Gessler, the evil Austrian uh, whatever, you know, sheriff, well, the Landberger. Yeah. That the Swiss were trying to throw out of of uh, Switzerland, where else, in order to achieve their independence, and so on and so forth. So we were talking about this, and um, one of my mates, who is uh, a, a well, he, you know, there's no harm in him, but he is a bear of little brain. Let's put it that way. He said, "Oh yes," he says, "That's right." He said, um, "And uh, it was oh, I, I, oh, I can't tell you who it was, who the actor was that played him." He said, "It was uh, it was William Conrad, wasn't it?" <laughs> so, of course, the rest of us, well, I mean, the beer just came straight down our noses. <laughs> because you could see what the problem was. William Tell was played by a bloke called Conrad Phillips. Yeah. But in my mate's logic systems, which aren't all, they, you know, they've been depth charged a bit, he, he thought William, William Tell, Conrad Phillips, William Conrad. <laughs> and he came up with that. And the thought of William Conrad playing William Tell... <laughs> Ah. You know, with the tights and everything. It'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? And the, uh, and the sheepskin, uh, what do you call it? Jerkin. Do you know, uh, uh, actually, actually... Sheepskin jerking something not we don't approve of, really. <laughs> I actually read it somewhere where William Conrad went for an interview to be the new 007 when one of them finished. Oh, come along, you yes, try, you're you know, trying my patience to the utmost. Forget, yeah. forget which paper that were in now. Was it, it wasn't in the sport, was it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's oh, right, that's yeah. the one I read, yeah. Oh. Oh. You want this gag? Cuckoo, come in, Mr. Bond. <laughs> come in, Mr. Bond. <laughs> Good grief, I wasn't <laughs> expecting you. Yes. Right, OK, do us a gag, then. Right, there's a big gang of fellas running down the street. Right up. There's this fella coming on the other way. He says, what's the matter, lads? And one of them shouts, there's a lion escaped from the zoo. He says, good God, which way is it going? He says, you don't think we're chasing it, do you? Da 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 <laughs> I thank you all. That was dreadful, but thanks, uh, you know, your heart's in the right place. Dear, oh dear me. Oh, we had some, had some good fun there. Um, 90 minutes to 12. Oh, stuff's flooding in from all... And I tell a gag, right? A punter writes the gag down, sends it off to a daily newspaper of questionable taste, and wins a tenner. And do you know what he's sent me as a token of his gratitude? Yes, that's right, a copy of the paper and a photograph of Bernard Manning, which is in itself a considerable reward. But hey, haven't some people got a nerve? Well, I'll tell you what, he hasn't printed, they haven't printed the radio version of it either because I had to tidy it up a little bit. Anyway, I'll name the guilty man later. 
And uh, we'll also have a chinwag about, uh, what have we got here? We've had a bit of a response to the thing about um, what we mustn't call pyramid selling anymore. Uh, what was it called? Multi-level marketing, drone, drone. Um, uh, not having any of that. Not that there's anything wrong with McDonald's, you understand. Right, I tell you, should I tell you, the, this appalling bloke, I see, we've got rid of the kid. Give us a ring now, uh, 07428520050. This is, uh, this letter is from, uh, this is, well, it's altogether peculiar, this. Gary, Gary, the, uh, the musician who apparently phoned in the other night and um, he, he got a bit embroiled in that discussion we were having about the uh, athletic prowess, or lack of it, of William Conrad, who played the famous detective Frank Cannon, you see. Anyway. I was surprised this morning to receive a large buff envelope containing a copy of a daily newspaper, uh, which you won't... Well, really, it's not for... You wouldn't confuse it with the people's friend, I can tell you. Right? It's the sport. So I'm a bit puzzled as to why this has happened, you see. Anyway, there's a, an explanatory note within it. Gary. FLSM, LLSM, TD, L... MUS, LSM, CT, VCM, ABCM. Right, these are all his qualifications. He's not, uh, he's not a Serb or anything like that. That's not his name. Anyway, professional musician, registered teacher of music, regional organiser. Now listen to this. Regional organiser for the Lancashire School of Music, Yorkshire area. Quel bizarre! Anyway, the body of the text reads as follows. He's from Doncaster, actually. James. I should like to thank Alan for his letter of confirmation regarding Frank Cannon having a black belt in judo. I wonder if he could also confirm that Frank was to become the next 007, if he were to have lived that long. In fact, I am told that the end of Frank came during the filming of a love scene with Samantha Fox. Please turn over. Oh, then there's a gag. Oh, I nearly did the... There's another gag there, which I can't possibly do. Anyway, carry on with the fabulous show, yours sincerely. Please find enclosed a copy of the Daily Sport. Turn to page 15 and read Bernard Manning's tenor-winning gag. I must thank you, James, as I got the gag from your show last week. This is outrageous. And on page 15, there it is, with a lovely picture of Bernard, that is most attractive. And it's the one about what's the fastest thing in the world. Um, electric light, speech, or unexpected incontinence? And of course, uh, the correct answer is number three. There we are, from Gary of Doncaster, South Yorks. And this wins a £10 note, a Crispy Crackley. So where's my, where is my consideration, Garfield? That's what I want to know. I feed you this stuff, you peddle it, and I get no credit whatsoever. N neither accolade nor ackers and i could do with both well i hate you and everything you stand for so if there are any more jokes to be told in this program i'm going to have a word with the engineering department and see if they can fix it so that jokes don't get broadcast to uh, to where you live and that'll tax them right uh, to doncaster now and oh i think this is this man doncaster and it's uh, gary hello james hello gary thank you very much thank you thank you thank you for what for that joke that you told the other week. Well, yes, thank you. I won a tenner. Uh, yes, so you did. Now, I think legally... Yeah? I think you're on pretty thin ice here. What are you on about legally? I think, actually, that's my gag. Well... <laughs> now, that's funny, isn't gag? I think I might have to take you to... Hey, no, there was a big... Th listen, there was a great big court case, wasn't Let there? Let me about... save you a bit of time. What, go on. You've got no chance of putting the spoof up me. Oh. Now oh, well, I'm afraid <laughs> that's where my conversation dies. Um, listen. What? You say you're not happy that I've only sent you the paper as a token of gratitude. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll send you a video of Frank Cannon if you want. Oh, could could you do? Well, yeah. I've, Cannon... got, I've got the feature lens. Cannon the movie? <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you, uh, have you got any more gags? Oh, uh, plenty, but you don't think you're going to get one off me, <laughs> hey? <laughs> Hey, I've got a serious point for you. A serious point, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now then, I read it in the paper the other day. Oh, uh, can I just interrupt you for a moment? Yeah? Yeah. I thought you did very well to, uh, you worked out what the last line was. Of the gag. Oh! Yeah. 
I had to what, what we call adapt it for radio. Yeah, you didn't uh, you didn't adapt it that much, though, did you? Hmm. You didn't adapt it that much. Uh, well, let's. Uh, we're not allowed to use asterisks I've, I've worked, on radio. I worked out. I worked out. Uh, you know, I had to put the round circle into the round socket before. <laughs> Oh, no, on earth. No idea what he's talking about now. Anyway, anyway yes. I read it in the paper the other day. Did you? That uh, a man in Singapore... Yeah. Uh, ...committed a driving offence. Yeah. Now, his punishment for that was two months in prison... Yeah. ...a £2,000 fine... Yeah. ...and a public flogging. Ah, yes. Yeah? Yes, I heard about this. Now, apparently in Singapore they've got a very low crime rate. Yeah. But would you say that's just a coincidence? Because I know you're not in favour of uh, capital punishment, are you? Uh, well, that's not capital punishment. That's corporal punishment. Flogging. Well, it's, it's, it's issued by the capital state. No, you nutcase. It's from capita, meaning head. Oh, it means well. cut your head off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know oh, what I'm that's... talking about. Hey, yeah, you've got a real uh, wacky sense of humour there, Gary. So, what I'm trying to say <clears> is, <throat> do you think... You've never been in San Quentin, have you? No. No, oh, I thought you were in the audience. Or, uh, <laughs> what uh, I'm trying to say is, did, yeah. would you say that that was sheer coincidence that they've got a low crime rate? Um, I don't really know. It depends. First of all, it depends what you, you uh, how you calculate the crime rate. Of course, that's very important. I, I, I think that if they had stiffer penalties in this country, you'd get rid of a lot of it. I mean, I know the argument is the ones that are really determined to do the crimes will still go on ahead and do them anyway. Yes. But you're still going to cut out an awful lot. Fancy sending a guy to Scarborough for committing an offence. He can't have done anything that serious. He's been... He, he's had 49 crimes, one of them's mugging an old lady. Yeah. And they sent him to Scarborough. And put him in a flat. Yeah, in fact, um, the, uh, the Isle of Man, I was, uh, I was listening to some, uh, old buffer from the Isle of Man saying that, uh, the existence of, uh, birching as a sanction on, uh, on the Isle of Man is, um... Uh, he considered it to be a considerable deterrent. Although the trouble is, you see, I mean, he said, oh, I, I, I knew of um, a, a licensee who was being threatened by some, uh, some uh, yobbos from the mainland, and when he reminded them that, that um, um, birching is uh, available to the magistrates here, uh -huh, they soon left him alone and moved off, I can tell you. You see, and he's, he's full of anecdotes like this, but um, the, the problem is that whenever you actually draw statistics, right? When you, you, you put together the changing patterns of crime and the changing nature of um, sanctions against them, then it doesn't seem that there is, in fact, any deterrent whatsoever. It has been impossible to prove. It's, 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 it's certainly possible to assert or to claim that hanging is a deterrent, because that's what happens, that's what your, your right-wing newspapers and your right-wing well, members of parliament... Well, that's another argument, isn't it? I mean, why on earth should we, should taxpayers, keep people in prison? Oh, dear me, for don't For serious offences like murder. What? what? Now, why do you say taxpayers? You mean because it costs money? Is that why you use it that? It costs money to keep a murderer alive. Yeah. If you've took a life, you should give a life. Well... I'm not sure that that's the case. Well, I'm I'm hundred percent sure. Oh well, in that case, uh, heaven forbid if you should ever become a high court judge. Ever, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. heaven forbid indeed. I'd yeah. sort them out. Oh, uh, I bet you would. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, the flaws in this argument are that uh, the number of murders yeah. has has changed not one whit since capital punishment. That's the hanging one since capital punishment was uh, abandoned in this Well, country. maybe that, maybe that's true, but y y well, but what? if you hang the people that's done the murders, at least they're not going to do it again, are they? Oh, letting my oh out what, a, what a miserable line to come out with. You, it's you, not a you miserable line, think. it's a fact. Oh, well, of course it is. In fact, if you just hang, hang people on spec, then they'll never murder anyone in the first place. You're not so... hanging people on spec, you're hanging people that kill people. Well... It's going to, oh, so it's going to stop them killing people again? Of course it is. Well, why not do it earlier and stop them killing the because first one? Because you don't one? know they're going to kill somebody till they do it. Oh, But why let them out me. to do it again after they've already proved themselves? So? Myra Inley, they're talking about letting her out. No, they're not. They are. No, they're not. Lord Longford's still droning on about it. Everyone's well, forgotten who Lord Longford is. Well, even if they don't let her out, she shouldn't be there. Get, get away with it. Well, she's not going to. The extraordinary thing is, though, and you'll like this, you'll, uh, you'll like this, Gary. Go on. You're really a musician. 
What about it? An organist? Yeah. Ooh, I bet you'd play all the what's it, all the backing tracks in Dracula films, don't you? <laughs> da, 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 da. Hey, come on, give us another gag. Right, no, never mind. I'm going to tell you something. When, um, <laughs> as I know what he does, in, in, the, in the summer he works on Blackpool Pleasure Beach, doesn't he? He stands in that glass case laughing at people as they go past. No. Not a gag. No, no, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you something now. How much of a deterrent do you think hanging is? Capital punishment is. I'm not trying to, that's not, that, that's missing my point, oh, really. Oh, no, all right, well, I, I shall... My point is... I it, shall not miss your point, then. It, it, it is a deterrent. Is it? To some degree. Right. To some degree. Right. But the point is, if it was there, then all these, like, somebody like the Ripper that's done it over and over and over again, he's only going to do it once. Right. Or he's only going to do it up until the point where he gets caught. Yeah. Well, in, in actual fact, the Ripper had done it 13 times... Before he got before caught. ...before he was caught, yeah. yeah so but he's that... not going to do it a 14th time. No, because he's in prison. Yeah, but if he gets out, if somehow he escapes mm. and it's happened, he so, could do it again. So do you think, say, in the case of, uh, of Brady and Hindley... Aye. ...if we'd had uh, capital punishment then then they, they would not have committed those murders. I, I'm not saying they wouldn't have committed them, but mm. they wouldn't have been stuck in a uh, place being kept and fed. Ah, so you're more worried about the cost than, no, I'm than not worried saving about, lives. It's, I, I am worried about the cost. Why should we keep them? But apart from that, mm. apart from that, they can't escape and do it again mm. if we get rid of them. Yeah, well, they're not, they're not going to uh, escape, are they? That's quite, they're quite clearly out of the question. No, but they, they've released... What about that guy who got released? Yeah. For it, it committed, it stabbed somebody, yeah. and the doctor said he was mentally stable. He released him, and he went and did it again. Yeah, well, he was it's released. It's in it that. Yeah. He, he, well, it's ser clearly a serious misjudgment. There's yeah, no. Well, what a shame! What a what a shame for well, sorry, the poor plastic for second bloke, innit? Well, no one would minimise, no one would attempt to minimise the gravity of of that uh, incorrect decision for one moment. Nah, but Not it, in it, the least if, bit. If, if that had been one life saved, if if they'd have hung that bloke as soon as they got him. Yes, assuming, of course, it was the right bloke. Well, if it, if it weren't the wrong bloke, he must have been in the wrong place to get arrested for something. He must have been under some suspicion. Mm. Anyway, oh, chance, chance been, to that, chance he, to he that, must, that no matter who it is, he must they've have done been, something wrong at some stage or other in the life anyway. He must have been under some suspicion? Yeah. So what, he must have been, what, going to pinch a car or something? Well, everybody's done something wrong, haven't they? So, oh, you know, right. if, if they accidentally hang the wrong bloke, well, that's... Oh, uh, well, like. it's utilitarianism, that, isn't it, eh? <laughs> your words, your exact words last night. It's well, a tough world. Yeah, why don't we just hang someone every now and again as an example? No, you can't do that. Why not? I thought you'd want to put your name down. You're hanging people that's committed crimes. Uh, well, unfortunately, you're not always hanging people who have committed crimes. All right, then, when it's proved beyond shadow of a doubt. Yes, but ob obviously, uh, people have been hanged when it's actually it hasn't been proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. So, uh, th therefore, then leave that, but what about proved beyond shadow of a doubt? Well, yeah, the thing is, you can look back now, you see, and say, ah, yes, uh, that's been proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. Yes, and, and that, uh, not that one, but never mind, these things happen. And him, and him, and him, and, yeah, and Ruth Ellis, and, and so on, and Derek Bentley. Oh, never mind Derek Bentley, perhaps we'll come back to that one later, and so on and so forth. Oh, all right, De I'll De you, I'll Sorry, no, you, Derek, you... Derek Beatty hasn't been hanged, but, um... You're good yeah, at that, math. That's, that's where your uh, no, hang on argument sways hang on me somewhat. You're good at math, so answer me one, ask me, answer me this. Yeah. Uh, if you had my system, right? Yeah. Are you going to save more lives than what you'll accidentally kill by hanging the wrong men? Are you going to save more lives? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. Oh, I would by a long stretch. Well, all right, you would, but the but the well, fact. Well, thank you very much. But the fact that you thank are, you very much. The fact that you are able That's to. That's a confession. You've no, admitted it, it. No, I I admitted that you said you would. The, You've agreed with me. The fact that you are able to say. I You've would. agreed with me. I, I agreed with the fact that you are saying what you are saying. I didn't agree with the, ver with the veracity of what you are saying. You seem to think purely because you can say, I would, in a deep, big Yorkshireman's voice, that that somehow wins the argument. It doesn't win the argument at all. How many people have been killed by people who have already been killed. Who, who, sorry, no, no what? none whatsoever. How many people have, you see, now that's an easy one. I'll give you a more difficult one now. <laughs> How many people have been killed by people who have already killed and subsequently been released? Well, who knows that? Oh, I thought you had all the facts and figures at your fingertips. But there won't be any if I had my way. But there would be a lot of people who hadn't killed anybody who would have been hanged. Wouldn't you be happy with that? 
You're just knack because I've won a tenner out of your gag, aren't you? Well, very much so, yeah, and I'm not selling you any more gags. Get out of it. Right, there we are. I enjoyed that. Uh, twelve minutes to twelve. He was... I'm sorry about this capital punishment thing, but we do have to go through it every now and again. It's like when a diphtheria jab wears off and you have to have a little booster. Well, we do a similar sort of thing here, you see. When your intelligence starts to uh, evaporate, then we give you another armful of it just to keep you going for a few months, you see. And I believe they're working on a similar scheme for members of Parliament, so they'll stop debating it every six years in the forlorn hope that they'll be able to bring it back. Right. Uh, where are we going to next? Oh, I don't know, but I'll tell you in a second. We must do this first. James H.G., this is, by the way, on the new Hallam FM at 11 minutes away from midnight. Uh, Gary Bentley, or Gary in Bentley. I'm not sure. Hello, Gary. Do you know what somnambulism is? I certainly do, sir. Do you? Yeah, well, of course I do. What? Sleepwalking. Oh, brilliant. Yeah? I'm so glad you knew that. You see, my dad said that you wouldn't know, and I thought, of course he will. He's bound to know. Yeah. So yeah. I bet him a tenner, you see, and I've just won another tenner. Have you won a tenner? Another one. Brilliant. Yeah. I keep I keep winning you tenors left, right and centre. I know. I'll, I'll send you Cannon Part 2. What do you do? I've received Cannon Part 1. <laughs> and I know where the expression cannonballs comes from now. <laughs> it's all horribly clear. Yes, well. You, uh, you like to talk about democracy, don't you? I think everyone should. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you say that vote, everybody should vote mm -hmm. because the less people that vote, mm -hmm. the less democratic the society comes. Yes. But don't you think that's an infringement on, de on democracy if you say that everybody should vote? Well, certainly to encourage people to vote. Yeah, but you said they should vote. Well, I, I believe, well, that's an encouragement, isn't it? You ought, you should vote. I didn't say you must vote. You yeah, but vote. if there's nobody that you fancy voting for. Well, the situation that, like, is in Australia is like this. Voting is mandatory. You have to go to the polling booth. You have to... What if you don't? If you don't, presumably they pinch you and fine you. I can't, right. see, I can't see that would work in this Well, it, no, it wouldn't work here. I mean, we have, we, prisons are bursting as it is. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I mean, nobody pays a fine when they get it. Or, or they could go and make you sit through Prime Minister's question time. Well, yeah, that might do yeah, it. Yeah, that, 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 that'd that be a short, short shot, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, and you have to go and register to show that you've been to the polling booth. You're then given a voting slip. Yeah. What you do with it is your business. Mm. Right. So you can spoil it, or whatever, or you can vote. But you have to vote. Why don't they just give both parties equal shares and let them get on with it and, and scrap the voting system forever? Because the both parties are in there anyway. And what, in this country? Yeah. Well, there's more than one party, bear in mind, and the, uh, the well, balance yeah, of... The, the lot of them, just let them get on with it. The balance of parties has played... I, I know, uh, there is, these days, a considerable difference between the parties for many years, for many, from 1951 until 1979. To be perfectly honest, Gary, as you very well know, you couldn't, apart from the odd bit of, mostly it was about unions, but it, the differences then were nothing like they, they are now. Mm. Um, you couldn't get a razor blade between them, to be honest, could you? No, not really. Two major parties. It was 19, 1979, well, it was the miners' strikes. The, which, the big which, difference now is that the Conservatives seem to be prioritising everything. Uh -huh. And the Labour Party doesn't seem to be in favour of that. Um, well, no. But then again, it's going to be a very, very costly exercise to, and self-defeating yeah, to, to nationalise it all again. To revert it all back again. Yeah. And the political climate has been changed very much by uh, 15 years of this lot. Look, I'm afraid we can't really start reorganising the economy of the United Kingdom and our major political philosophy at this time. So I'm going to call it a day, and I'll tell you what, this is Bruce after the news. I've got a little gift here. It's very kindly sent through the post from, ah, yes, the organist, Gary Burt, who is, as I mentioned before, FLSM, LLSM, TD, LMUS, LSM, CTVM, VCM, AVCM, VCR, BPS and D. A professional musician, and the, as we know, the registered organiser, re regional organiser for the Lancashire School of Music, Yorkshire area. 
That's what we must be going to take you over. Anyway, he says, uh, Dear James, a composer always uses a pencil, so if he or she changes his or her mind, they can rub it out. Please tell the caller who was talking about Rolex watches that they do in fact tick, not swivel. That's the, the second hand. Yeah, I'm not sure. Right. Anyway, yours sincerely, Gary. PTO, and then there are two, two gags that we can't possibly use at all. Oh dear, oh dear. Um, for each of the above gags that you broadcast, you win a prize. Offer only lasts 14 years. Well, I tell you what, I'm not doing either of those. I shall, obviously, I shall use them in private company, but uh, not on the wireless. It's terrible. When you think that a man there, who's got the musical future of people in his hands, has, thinks that jokes like that are funny. Uh, anyway, the present is, of course, a pencil. Now, you'll be sorry to hear this, Gary, because it has arrived in the dreaded polythene bag. Royal Mail Customer Service Centre. Dear customer, I'm very sorry that the enclosed letter has been damaged in our letter sorting machinery. Although we do all we can to prevent such damage, it does occasionally occur because of the vast volume of mail processed. If you think any contents of the letter are missing as a result of the damage, please return the envelope to us, together with this wrapper, and we will arrange for investigations to be made. Please accept my sin sincere apologies for any annoyance or inconvenience you may have been caused. Well, I've been caused tremendous annoyance. Uh, yours sincerely, custom customer services manager, whose name appears to be DB. You know what that means. Anyway, yes, oh, my annoyance and, and inconvenience arises from the fact that the present which was sent me was, in fact, a an HB pencil made in China. Now, numerous though the advances are which the Chinese people have made over the years, they have not yet manufactured a pencil which can, which can withstand an automatic letter-facing machine because the pencil has arrived not in two pieces, nay, even unto three, but yea, I say verily unto you, in four pieces. And the bit with the rubber on it is about an inch and a quarter long. So one, by the time I've sharpened it, it's all over. It's a waste of time. I won't be able to make any mistakes to rub out. I just, I, I've got to see other people, see if they've got any mistakes they want me to rub out for them. So, uh, it, I mean, obviously it's the thought that counts in this case, Gary, isn't it? Because the pencil itself is uh, about as much use as an ashtray on a motorbike. So, uh, anyway, thanks all the same. I'm not sure whether we can reconstruct it. If we've got some glue. Might get a glue expert on the programme later. Talk about that. Right, thank you very much indeed. We move on to a letter which I am actually going to read rather than just tell you about. And it's from Gary. Gary, the uh, musician. Professional musician from Doncaster. And he's always forever sending me stuff, and I do enjoy it. And this is quite uh, exceptional. First of all, he says, uh, Enclosed is a recording of some of the best calls from the programme. When I give a concert, I play this tape in the interval. Oh, yeah. And people always ask me how much they are. I think Victor Borger does the same thing. Would you mind if I flogged them for a fiver? Oh, now, come along, Gary. I think we'll have to come to some sort of arrangement, because I have the ability... It, it, oh, plenty of it, yes. I'll, I'll sue him within an inch of his, uh, of his life. It's, uh, be, another thing is that because of various magnetised bones in my sinuses, I can, if I so desire, place an electronic tone which is inaudible to the human ear. I can transmit it, but it will, uh, it will place an ear-piercing... Oh, what did I say then? An, that's right, ear-piercing whistle. I must remember not to use that one again. On your tape, which will scramble your brains, you see. So unless you uh, come to some sort of financial agreement with me, then I will inflict this appalling sanction upon you. Mm, it's a bit like, you know, if you rub your, rub your finger around the uh, rim of a wine glass and it starts to make that. Have you ever done that? Well, Annie Pan's never done that. Is What's a glass, she said. Oh. Right, well, I'll show you. I'll show you a number of um, clever tricks involving wine. And uh, never mind that. Listen, we've already been told to uh, behave ourselves once this week. Anyway, on to the main body of the letter. <clears throat> Please find enclosed a copy of this month's Take a Break magazine. Yes, lucky you sent it to me, Gary, because I, I hadn't picked up my copy from the newsstand yet. I always read Take a Break, yeah. Um, and it's like, uh, 
It's like Hello Magazine, only for the hard of thinking. Right? But, he says, you will observe... Oh, I mean, there might be a little bit of a backhander from the publishers here. The reason I've sent it to you is because it features on the inside front cover a picture of your pal. Top man. Funniest man in the world. In fact, we'll conduct an experiment here with Annie Pan. We'll summon her from the glass bowl in which she uh, tries to look as if she's working. Come and hear you. Right, that's never Helen Ledra. She doesn't look like that. She looks wicked on that uh, washing up liquor advert or whatever it is. Yes, here he is. Top man, sorted geezer, funniest man in the world, number one. Here he is at his most be beautiful. And here's Annie to give an untutored opinion. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Hey, he's got a few bob, you know. You'll be all right, it'd suit you. <laughs> I don't care how much money he's got. Really? Oh, no. So beautiful, really beautiful. Hey, he's got a Rolls Royce, lovely little terrace house in Blakely. Oh, he's, he's not quite as fat as I thought he was actually. <laughs> well, he's been looking after himself. Yes, that's pants. right. <laughs> lovely pants. <laughs> it's, he answers the door in those, <laughs> honestly. There's no holes in them now. No, I'll oh, put them on special for a, you know. know. Yes, thank you. We just wanted to uh, research that one. Thank you. You can keep this afterwards. Yes, I'm sorry, dear listener. You, um, you're probably wondering what all this is about. It is, of course, if you didn't guess from the description, it is the one and only Mr. Bernard Manning, who is there resplendent in his look on his lovely moquette armchair and his red sculpted shadow pile carpet. Um, just ringing up on the phone to the bookies. But he's fast asleep in his singlet and underpants. And what a sight it is. And I'll tell you this, absolutely. If you go around to his house, his mother answers the door. 92 she is. Honest to God. And uh, it's, there, uh, oh, it's Bernard in. And she always says, hey. You say, is Bernard in? She says, yes, come in. And he'll be there in his, in his vest and underpants like that. And he says, hello, lad. Which I like. Oh, yeah, yeah. And his pants are over the back of the settee. And his money's in his back pocket. Right. He says, mother, mother, give us me pants. Hey, you are, Bernard. And he'll, he'll get his money out and pays you, this friend of mine. And uh, that's it. He spends his afternoons watching the racing. Put him, place him bets over the phone. And he wins a few, I tell you, he knows, he knows what he's doing. So there we are. Thank you very, very much indeed, Gary. That is, um, that will save me buying a copy this week. And I shall, uh, I shall frame that. That's a beauty. Oh, and he's got his socks on as well, which I always think is very attractive. Lovely man. He is. Top geezer. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. Right then, top geezer, by the way, is a bit of Mancunian slang, which I'm, I've decided to introduce to the area. To East yeah. Germany. Because yeah. they're famous for having big fat women there, aren't they? Yeah. See, rightly or wrongly. But it's wrong. It's, it's bad for my health to be overweight. Of course it is. It's not a good thing to be overweight. I know, but as Bernard Manning, as Bernard Manning demonstrated at a do, right, he says, look at me, he says. I like a drink. I like a smoke. He says, I like a bit of, you know, when I can get hold of it, he said. He said, and look at this. And he, he briefly tap danced. And then he said, there you are, he says, Sammy Davis Jr. can't do that, can he? And he was absolutely right. Because he's dead. <laughs> yes, that's right. Listen, get off you. We've got just uh, four minutes or so to cram in. Of, uh, who, who did you say? Gary. I don't know what she's doing in there. I think she does, I think she does a bit of, uh, Dressmaking or something. She's a moving st You know when you see people moving piles of cut cloth around? What is it? Oh, that, that boat learning will never do you any good. I don't hold with it. Anyway, let's have Gary. Hello, Gary. Hello, James. Hello there. Darling, uh, let me put a stop to you getting on about fat people. Okay, then. If you've got any problems about fat people, yeah. take them up with Bernard Manning. Right. He will put paid to you, I can assure you. I, I, shall, speak, I shall speak to the gentleman when we next meet at, uh, to watch Manchester City. 
Ah, right, they'll come off second. Say, <laughs> listen, no, I, I can't... If you, if you can have the last word with Bernard Manning, you'll be the first. Well, we, we did a gig together. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, it was, it was me him, and George Best, right? Now, George Best was as right as rain. He was, he was wonderful. He was sober, he was funny. In fact, it, I believe he did a do round here mm. the following night, or a couple of nights thereafter. And he was, uh, there was a big row, he was, he was booed off and, or, or something. But anyway, uh, George Best was brilliant. And Bernard and I were at opposite ends of the top table. And there was an incident when, uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you the story. <laughs> I, I w well, you can probably imagine why. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. Because a duel did develop, but if I attempted to even give you a gist of it, <laughs> I'm afraid you might be deprived of the privilege of my entertaining you. Well, yes, yes, yes. Now, then, on to this business about that tape that I've sent you. Oh, yes, indeed. What a cheek you've got. Why? To ask me for a percentage cut. I'll tell you this, right? Yeah. As true as I sit here. As true as I'm milking this frog, yes. I was laid in bed the other morning. Yes. And, as usual, I awake to the new Hallam FM. Uh, but, of course. Now, what should I hear but me and thee having a squabble? On radio, and oh. I, thought, I thought, what's going off here? It's about ten o'clock, and to my amazement, you've cut me yep. out of a conversation to use as an advert for your show. Absolutely. What a cheek! Well, isn't this re the, the sheer privilege? Isn't that rewarding itself, oh. Garfield? <laughs> and then you want a percentage cut? Oh, well, there's no repeat fees in this game, you know. <laughs> That's why I have to keep thinking up new stuff. Are you all right? Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Now, another thing. Yes. I sent you a pencil and it got crushed. It was crushed. It was broken into four separate segments. And you said that you were surprised that a man in my position yeah. would write down gags like that. Oh, that you well, I mean, they were saucy in the extreme, I feel. Well, I'm a Bernard Manning fan. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, there is that. Well, there you go. I've heard him tell some clean ones. And I mean, I can't take this up with you now because you haven't got time. All right. But nevertheless, you still missed my point on what I said about hanging people, didn't you? What was that? It's not a deterrent. It's a punishment. Yeah. Well, there you go. You seem to think that I'm trying to say it's a deterrent. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, a de yeah but wh why? Not a deterrent. The Americans have proved that. That's, that's right, and, uh, But corporal punishment, now that is a definite deterrent. I've got a mate who's told me that if he'd have been whipped for some of the things he did when he was younger, yeah. he would definitely not have done them again. Why, has he been whipped? No, but can't, what he's trying to say is, he did things when he was younger, yeah. which, had he been whipped for them, he wouldn't have done them again. But so, it'd, it'd have done them once, wouldn't he? But they say, ah, but not again and again and again. Now, what I'm trying to say is, if, if one person says that, there must be thousands out there that think the same. Well, p possibly, I possibly. rest my case. But, I mean, why... Oh, look, no, you're absolutely right. He said, look, can we... <laughs> can I make an appointment to start this earlier? Because I'll sort you out in, in no I uncertain... I will phone you back fashion. earlier on Sunday night, and I, I'll get... I'll, I'll top you on this. Well, I doubt it. But I know so. You, you're willing, you're very, very welcome I to try. I, 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 it's a promise. I'm willing to give you enough rope to be, oh no, perhaps we better not use that expression. Anyway, right. Is it over? Please tell me it's over. Is it, is it, is it over? No, it's Oh no. Yes, it is over. But for you, it carries on, because Bruce is next. Hey, hang on. So, smashing. Um, I don't understand that at all. Right, uh, Gary now is on the phone. Hello, Gary. Hello, James. Hello there. Uh, hello, Garfield. Where are you calling from? Uh, Doncaster. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Have you ever read a book called Supernature? Supernature? Royal Watson. Um, now, it's all about, it's, it's along the Eric Von Daniken line of, isn't it? Ah. Uh, well, balmy ideas, basically. <laughs> well, he, he's supposed to be a scientist, isn't he? A, a biologist. Who writes purely about facts as opposed to fiction. Well, he may very well claim that, yeah. Well, he's supposed to write about things that scientists have proved beyond mm. shadow of doubt. Yeah. 
Mm. And yet some of the things in here, as you say, are balmy. Go on, give us some examples. You see, this is all um, rubbish. Well... Go on, go on, go on. Just before I do give you some examples, mm -hmm. um, I'll just say something to annoy you. If well, I may. But, uh, if too, I may. too late. <laughs> well, uh, over the last few nights, you've had people on about ghosts. Which, no, what, we had one... Which, uh, no, you've had two or three, you've had no. two or three. Have we? Uh, well, uh, you lose count after a while. And uh, you always say the, the, the same thing to them, that they don't exist. Well, of course they don't. Well, uh, you've done science, haven't you? Because you, 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 you must have done. I've done science, yeah. So, therefore, you, you must know the golden rule of science. What? Well, you cannot prove that something does not exist. No one can do that. No. So therefore, you can't say that ghosts don't exist. No, but you can... I also did philosophy. Yeah. And you can therefore establish beyond reasonable doubt that ghosts do not exist. Yeah, yeah. Well, this guy in this book, he, he, he says exactly what you say, that they don't exist. All right. So, I mean... It, it, that, that sounds that, an admirable book. That's logical, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. Uh, however, astrology, do you believe in that? No. Well, according to what I've got here, the... Uh, newspaper version of the 12 zodiac signs mm. is a load of nonsense because you can't categorize all the people on this planet into 12 signs. No. However, if you go further than that as to the investigations by Vernon Clark, are you familiar with them? Is this the man who found out that, m that a majority, or not a majority, but a preponderance of athletes are born under the uh, uh, influence of the planet Mars? <laughs> you know some stuff, don't you? I certainly do. Uh, exactly that, yes. Yeah. Fancy me knowing that, eh? Well, yeah. Um... <laughs> um... That's taken the wind out of your sails, hasn't it, eh? <laughs> hey? <laughs> hey? Well... Russell Grant, hey? Hey? A group of herpetologists. Oh, what? A group of herpetologists. Herpetologists? Yeah. What do they study? I'm not sure. I was hoping you'd tell me. Well, herpes, by the sound of things, doesn't sound like much of a job to me. Well, a, a group of librarians or musicians, it's not really important. Okay. They're all born on particular, like, musicians are supposed to be born on a rise in Pluto. And apparently 85,000 studies of them mm. prove that they are. What, all of them? Yeah, or every single one of them, yeah. We are any, we are any myth. Now, that, that, that must be... Some kind of evidence. What, what was the name of this book? Vernon Clark. Vernon Clark, that's right, yeah. And it's, it's printed in the Supernature book by Lyle Watson. Right, well, a geezer whose name I can't remember, right. I once spoke to, and he was trying to, not trying to establish that um, there is anything in astrology whatsoever, but what he was doing, he had, he had embarked upon a, a statistical approach very similar to the to the sort of Vernon Clark thing. And he'd been inspired by Vernon Clark's idea. And he thought, well, if you can do that for athletes, you can do it for all sorts of other people, professions. But, but I mean, of course, that presupposes that you can judge people by their profession, for example. Yeah. Right? I mean, would, would you, if you're talking about, uh, let's say, musicians, would you put uh, John Williams and uh, Shabba Ranks would you say that they, you know, both, uh, th they're both musicians, therefore they have, uh, they're obviously very similar in many ways? No, you probably wouldn't, would you? Well, no, you wouldn't, no. no okay. So you've got to, uh, first of all, you've got to assume that his, uh, his, his premises are, are in order. But he was setting about doing this huge, huge, huge survey, uh, finding out when, finding out people's birthdays, which birth sign they're under, and seeing, just seeing, if there were any statistically significant differences to emerge, or similarities, let's put it that way. Mm. Unfortunately, the wind was rather taken out of his sails when he was well into, this was after I'd, I'd interviewed him, when he was well into his research by the discovery that Vernon Clark had lied. Well, this is what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. Are these studies by this uh, loyal Watson and his colleagues, yeah. are they actual proof and fact, or is it just a book he's put together? I would imagine, on the basis of uh, the jiggery pokery and charlatan ship which surrounds all this, <laughs> that it's just a load of nonsense slammed together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for the benefit of the gullible, mentioning no names, Gary. <laughs> well, what about the further studies? That he's got 
horoscopes of different groups of people. Yeah. And he's given them to astrologists. Yes. And they've worked out from the horoscopes which people are which. Yeah. With 98% accuracy. Oh, well, I... I should imagine that this 98% accuracy has been very, very carefully contrived. I would think that the test conditions have been very meticulously set up, I would think. Let me put something to you that I don't think you can get out of. Right. The moon controls the oceans, the tides. That's, that's been proved, hasn't it, it? Well, it exerts an influence, yes. It yes. has an influence over the rhythms of the tide. The rhythm of the rain, yes. Yeah, and it's because of these rhythms yeah. on the planet, mm. apparently, which influence people. Give over. Well, it's bound to, isn't it? Is... Because we are rhythm... We are, every, every life form on, on the planet is, is controlled by some kind of rhythms. Well, they, they say black people more so than others. <laughs> So I'm led to believe. There's no way out of this. No, what? The, no. The, the, the reason... Listen, do you know where the word lunatic comes from? Yes, of course. Where? Oh, it's from the Latin lunus, meaning moon, isn't it? Yeah, and, and when, apparently when there's a full moon, the rhythms are stronger, which is why there is some truth in certain people going mad at a full moon. At certain times of the, of the month, yeah. Or, or, or crazier than what they might normally be. Yes, indeed. Well, for a start, well, there must be some truth in it, then. Well, there may, there, there may be some truth in it, but you've got, to, you've got to bear in mind, you say, that the observations made by people when the word was coined may not have been... But the, the people making those ob observations will have been observing from the point of view which was concomitant with the popular beliefs of the time. Concomitant? Yes, which fits in with... Right? So they, they would look... look let, let, let me give you a, a very straightforward example. Um, if you were to ask someone in 1300, yeah. what happens if you sail across that sea there? They would say, yeah. well, you fall off the end, obviously. Yeah, I, I know what you're going to say, right? but bearing in mind that, in, that there's been some very, very clever people. Oh, there ain't have been some clever geezers. Uh, even, even as far back as that. Yes, but the majority of people, the vast majority of people... I wouldn't have thought, thought that they'd have the vast majority of people look, they, on, on things like this. Right, Surely they, they'd have the more clever of the bunch. They, they burnt Leonardo da Vinci at this stake... <laughs> yeah. ...for saying that the Earth goes round the sun. They wouldn't have it. <laughs> they would not tolerate the concept. Mm -hmm. right? We now know, of course, that it is true. It is entirely true. But the finest minds of the time said, this is not true. The Earth is the centre of the universe because it is the special planet where God's creatures have been placed exclusively. And therefore to say that the Earth goes round the sun is not only misguided and misinformed, but it is heresy. So up you go in smoke, pal. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, that's and that's and, and they, they, they were the leading authorities of the time. They were the cleverest men in the world, and they were completely wrong. Yeah, but they didn't have the equipment then uh, to, to find out that what they've got now. No, well, of course, but they were absolutely right. They, as far as they were concerned, they were absolutely right, weren't they? As far as they were concerned, civilization had reached its peak. But what does that prove? It proves that when people judge things, they judge things according to the criteria available. Yeah, but I, and, uh, I, I'm only referring to criteria um, delved into in 1990. Right. Now, if you go if you go back to the the origin of the expression lunatic, you see. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about these studies by Vernon Clark with uh, uh, and these musicians and librarians and right. art critics yeah. and whatever. Yes, but you, you you made an important point. Um, you said that uh, the, the l lunacy is comes from the word for moon because well, it, it was observed that people behaved differently according to the phases of the moon. But there you see, has to be some explanation. Well, oh, oh, yes, crazy yes, that, that, people, that, yeah, there, there does have to be some explanation as well. And in, every, in everything that has been handed down, that there is some element of truth. In, in every stereotype, in every legend, there is some element of truth. But there is only some element. Now, people observing the behaviour of what we would now describe as, as mental illness, as severe mental illness, mm -hmm would be observing it with a completely different set of criteria in mind 
than we would have today. They would have a completely different view of religion, they would have a completely different view of the social order, they would have a completely different view of mental illness, they would believe in goblins and all this carry on, mm -hmm. and therefore their observations cannot be accurately made. If you, if you look at, let me give you an example, you look at medieval drawings. Now, people there were looking at a scene with the same eyes as we're looking at them 500, 800, 1,000 years later, weren't they? Yeah. Right. So they would see the same thing. Y yeah. Have you ever noticed that the perspective is rubbish? Isn't it? And got, what, how do you mean? You've got men as tall as trees and... <laughs> on, only only four people can get in a in a great big sailing ship. Oh yeah, right? I see what you mean. Now why did they do that? Are we to assume that people were that sailing ships were only little tiny things that only four people could get in? No, well, because it's a lack of skill in in, in no, uh, no. drawing comparisons, isn't it? No, 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 it's not. What a lack of skill in drawing. In, in drawing comparisons, yeah. No, because people wanted to show the important events, so they drew the important things and the other things bigger. Didn't Mm. And, the, and the unimportant things smaller. You That's see. a childish thing right. to do, isn't it? As, as recently as the, I think it was probably the 17th century, when people saw the first orangutans. All right. Now you've seen you've seen every which way but loose, haven't you? you? Know what an orangutan looks like? Yeah. Yeah. People drew them as being like humans. You know your films as well, don't you? Well, uh, sorry if you can call that a film. <laughs> yeah. Go on. You, pe people drew them as humans with no head and a face in the chest. Now, the, these weren't nutcases who saw that. These were people who'd managed to navigate their way to the, the Far East, to the, the East Indies and so on, where orangutans abound. And these people, perfectly sensible men, looked at them and that was what they imagined they saw. Mm. Now we know, as we know perfectly well now, that an orangutan is nothing like that. It's a member of the ape family, but that's what they saw. Well, they made that judgment because that is the way they th they thought. That hardly. Do you read the uh, Focus magazine? Is that another one for uh, complete eccentric? No, it's a monthly. Thing. I would have thought you'd read something like that. It's something like Omni. It, it, it's uh, it's an interesting thing on facts, you know. This month's all about um, psychopaths and how to detect one if you think you're associated with Oh, well, i better get a copy of that, then. It's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It gives you uh, 18 questions, and, and you answer each question, and you score so many for each. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, know, yes, that yes. sort of thing, based on uh, very clever ways of how a psychopath would behave. Yeah. Oh, well, fair, yeah. It's a very... Observable fine, behavior, isn't it? fair enough, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, look, never mind all that. The moon, the moon, influences the tides because of gravity. Yeah, but right. well, we must be affected by that. We well, yes, of, of course, otherwise we'd all float away. Yeah, but, I mean, does it affect the thinking of certain people? No, of course it doesn't. Well, how can you say that? Well, because, why should it? There's no reason it's why it because, possibly could. Of course it is. No, there isn't. Yeah, the slightest. Is. Eh? Why? Because if you went and stood under large, very powerful magnets... Yes. ...you would be affected mentally by it. That's a fact. They it, proved it on animals, cockroaches. Yeah, of course they have. On cockroaches. Yeah. <laughs> well, if if any living being or thing is affected by that, yeah. then surely we are. It's like fish. Um, like take take birds. Uh, at certain times of the year, they fly to different parts, don't they? Yeah. Well, how do they detect to do that? Well, they probably ring the AA, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, well, no, but we're affected by it, aren't we? We're not affected by anything. Yeah, of course we are. We're certainly not so affected. So you wouldn't lose your senses then? Well, you've only got to, you've only got to go around these uh, showcases to, to prove that you were affected by it. There's a, there's a place in Blackpool where you, you've got to walk down a straight path, but you can't yeah. do it because the sides and the ceiling are moving and you, you fall over. Yes, of course, yeah, but I mean, that is uh, simply a case of disturbing the senses, isn't it? That's uh, right. Yeah, of uh, uh, disturbing well, the well, knowledge it, that you receive. Don't disturb the senses if you've got great big planets and, and moons pulling on different gravity pulls and yeah, all that. It's a, yes, but we've coped with it, haven't we? Well, we think we have. But to what well, extent? I suppose, I suppose looking round, you, you must be in two minds as to whether we're coping with anything. <laughs> well, listening to some of your callers. 
Well, yes, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Present company accepted. <laughs> Possibly. Mm. Right. No, I'm afraid it, it's <clears throat> it's all cack. This, I'm afraid. You'll just have to accept <laughs> this. I'm afraid. Well, you Garfield. can't prove that, though. You've got to admit. There's no logical reason whatsoever. There's simply. For well, a, there's plenty of logical reasons. There, there, no, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there, there is there is an imperceptible gravitational pull exerted by planets which we which must affect which people. Can, what, affect them in what way? Make what? them artistic? Well, no, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go along with that. No. But it must what? have some effect. Could make them crazy. Certain people that can't handle it. You know what I mean? Why? Why? Well, like we've just said about these uh, these lunar rhythms. Yes, but there's no there, there's nothing to satisfy me mm -hmm. that well, these observations are correct. Well, right. they've done um, tests on, you know, train accidents, aeroplane accidents, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Would you go along with the fact that when a train leaves a particular place daily to another mm -hmm. particular place, mm -hmm. and the average amount of people on that train from place A to place B, yeah. it's um, figure X. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it won't be tomorrow, but anyway, go on. <laughs> okay, yeah. But uh, on a general rule, yeah. yeah now, right, when accidents occur, the average amount of people on the train or the plane yeah. is always significantly lower. So much so as it's to be a hundred to one chance against people not having some kind of premonition that that accident's going to take place. I didn't understand a word of that. Well, it appears that people seem to either naturally avoid... ...down and killed by Stevenson's rocket. Yeah, go on. Right. In 1830, was it? Did you know that? I did, yeah. At the opening run, an MP was knocked down and killed by the first How train ever. I could possibly have known that. Well, I know it. Well, how do I know you could have made it up? Well, it's true. Well, all right, if it's if it's not true, then somebody ring up and tell me that. Well, who's going to okay. know that in the Sheffield area? Somebody will. Somebody You've got to be joking. That, that nutcase who keeps ringing up and saying, where were first engine? Sheffield. Where were first football club? Sheffield. Where were first test tube? <laughs> Sheffield. <laughs> that nutcase, he'll be on the phone shortly, and he'll know. Right, right. right. The only thing is, I, I think the, the MP's name was, was it Hutchinson or Hutchison? It was not, he, the idiot walked, he said, bye, Joe, he said, this is a fine invention, Mr. Stevenson. Walked right in front of it and was knocked down and killed. And Mr. Stevenson said, I should have warned you, that's the one thing you're not supposed to do, is stand in front of it. But what it was, are you trying to, what, what are you so, trying yeah, so what I'm going to say is, that it, assuming that the experts whom you uh, clearly enjoy <laughs> have gone into the precise details of every railway accident which, is, which has ever occurred mm -hmm. since 1830, whenever it was, yeah. right? And they have amassed that evidence. And if they can prove that whenever there is a railway accident, there are fewer people on the train than there are the rest of the time, yeah. then I shall have to concur that this is indeed statistically true. However, Garfield, it is, say it's all a coincidence. it is a massive, a massive leap to say, therefore, the people who chose not to get on the train must have known what was going to happen. I'm afraid that does not follow, does it? Well, they're not saying that they know what will happen. Ah. They're, they're saying that it's like an inbuilt thing which you don't know about. Right. But you sort of sense it. Oh, I see. But you don't know you've sensed it. You just haven't bothered to go on that train for some particular reason. I see. Which you don't know about. Well, it, seem, it seems to me to be stretching the imagination to its <laughs> very limits <laughs> to make that assumption. Right? Because logic has, logic has its own form, you see. Mm -hmm. All cats are grey. Yeah. This is a cat, therefore it is grey. That's true, right? <laughs> that's, no, this is, this is how logic works. Okay? That's true then, isn't it? If all cats are grey, and this is a cat, therefore it is grey. Okay? Never mind what colour cats really are, mm. but they are. Okay. Mm. All cats are grey, this is grey, therefore it, it is a cat. You, you're that a hardened scientist, That doesn't, that aren't doesn't you? work. You're a hardened scientist. You yeah, won't believe in anything that can't be either seen touched. Well, I, I believe Proven that... beyond shadow of doubt. I believe that Manchester City will one day win the Football League Championship, and there's precious little evidence of that. But I believe it firmly. 
Well, why is there precious little evidence of that? Because they're playing like a lot of plonkers, but, frankly. But, but how many teams have played like a lot of plonkers in the past and then come right to the top? Um, well, a few, but... And how many teams that have had great runs like Liverpool have then sunk down to that level before climbing back up again? Depends how long you're going to wait, doesn't it? Well, that, uh, absolutely. There we are, then. Mm. I don't see what that proves. But anyway, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't engage in this any further. So, uh, that was a lot of nonsense. Anyway, but it was very nice of you to uh, call in and try and make those points to me. Oh, looks of mercy. Uh, time is, is pressing upon us. We must do this before we go any further.